Welcome, Dominic to Fanjo. You have good news for us? Well, that is a matter entirely in your hands. You're having repeatedly rejected the gracious hand of God. Are you the hand of God, Dominic? Or the hand of the Pope? The sword of God is sharp. It has two sides, Gilbert de Castro, but it is one sword. Eight hundred years after Egyptian monks buried their Gnostic Gospels at Nag Hammadi, the Roman Catholic Church faced a revival of Gnostic heresy. In the late 12th and early 13th centuries, a conflict arose between the Church and a movement of French Gnostic Christians in the province of Languedoc. Like Gnostics elsewhere, the French Cathars regarded themselves as true, even perfected Christians. They called themselves the good men. Their descent sprang from warfare among local noblemen, a mood of regional independence which continues today, and above all, a resentment of the power and impositions of the Catholic Church. The fortified medieval villages of Languedoc still bear the evidence of the defeat of the good men's heresy. At Villerouge, below the ruins of the castle of Telm, an annual festival commemorates the arrival here in 1321 of the Archbishop of Narbonne. The Archbishop's mission was concluded with the burning at the stake of the last perfected Cathar or Parfait, Bellibast. The word Cathar comes from Greek katharos, it means purified. And being purified wasn't simply a state of belief, it was a process, it was something which had to be done to you in the Cathar ceremony of the Consolamentum, which was really the rock upon which the whole structure of Cathar belief and practice rested. The essence of the story of Catharism spans no more than 80 years and ends at the middle of the 13th century. The Cathar heresy was a localized medieval Gnostic Christianity. It rejected the authority, wealth, and secular power of the Catholic Church. The Cathars seemed, to many of their followers, to express more fully the Christian teaching. They lived devout lives of poverty and chastity, rejecting power and possessions. And their theological concepts were clearly Gnostic. There is the idea that there are two creations, one good and one bad, and therefore two creators. The idea that the soul belongs to the good creation and is an exile and prisoner of the world, that is, of the bad creation. The idea that salvation can only be achieved by enlightened knowledge. All that is Gnostic. But it should not be forgotten that Catharism is a form of Christianity and has always seen itself as a form of Christianity, even as the true Christianity. Cathars claimed a personal inner route to salvation, a Gnostic route. They adhered to a symbolic, not literal interpretation of most Christian teaching. Their only scriptures were the Gospels and the Lord's Prayer. Their only ceremony, baptism by laying on of hands, the consolamentum. Their heresy was compounded by permitting women an almost total equality. Women, in effect, were ordained and therefore conducted religious ceremonies and administered the sacraments. Their liberalism was typical of the individuality of the region. The Cathar movement developed above all in specific political areas in the counties of Toulouse and Foix and around Albi, Carcassonne and Béziers. 
One has the impression that it was the tolerance of political leaders which led to Catharism developing here. The people of Ville Rouge put on the costumes of the Catholic Archbishop and his entourage as an ironic tribute to those who defeated their Cathar ancestors. But the festival celebrates the memory of their rebellion, which was popular, local and spiritual. Today, local historians like Michel Rothbert and foreign scholars like Bob Moore have pieced together the vivid story of the defeat of Catharism. It was the secular alliance of the Roman Church and the French Crown, employing fortune-hunting noblemen and foreign mercenaries, which destroyed the Cathars' Gnostic alternative and condemned it as heresy. In the year 1163, an assembly of prelates of the Catholic Church at Tours ordained that stern measures should be taken against a new heresy that has appeared in Gascony and Provence and is spreading through that region like a cancer. During the years that followed, they very rapidly gained supporters and sympathizers in this area and played a central role in a series of both dramatic and traumatic events which formed one of the turning points in the history of Western Europe and of the French Kingdom. We're looking straight into the heart of the country in which the Cathars began to settle in the 1160s and 1170s and in which they found a great deal of support both from the local lords and so far as we can tell also from the peasants. The largest collection of research archives on the Cathars is held at the Centre for Cathar Studies in the Chateau at Villegli near Carcassonne. Grants from the French government have enabled the centre's director, and Manon, to compile files and libraries of material which have proved invaluable to students of the Cathar heresy. We have a large amount of chronicle evidence. We have vernacular poetry. And most of all, we have the very voluminous records of the Inquisition, thousands of which still survive and which reveal a great deal, not only about the beliefs and organizations of the Cathars, but incidentally about all sorts of details of their way of life. For the Cathars, the visible world isn't God's world, and God is foreign to this world. The visible world was created by the devil. So one might say that Cathars hated this world. But hatred is an expression of evil, and the Cathars could not allow themselves to hate. They wished only to love. Cathars tried as much as possible to be indifferent to the world, to matter, to the flesh, indifferent even to the beauty of the world. In the late 11th century, the beauty of the world was perhaps obscure to the peasant farmers struggling to survive while their region's strategic importance gave rise to constant warfare among outsiders. The Counts of Toulouse were trying to construct a great principality which stretched from 100 miles that way in the direction of the Atlantic, 150 miles that way towards the Rhone. And down there were the Counts of Barcelona and the Kings of Aragon who wanted to control the same country. In 1181, a papal legate came here, a man called Stephen of Tournay, and he described this country as one of vast deserts ruled by the fury of brigands and the image of death, of burned houses and ruined villages where there's no order, no tranquility, nothing that doesn't threaten security and menace life itself, which is very much the way that the Cathars saw it too. Cathars found the world and its creator alien from God, like earlier Gnostics, 
yet they had no knowledge of Gnostic scriptures, like those hidden in Egypt. The heresy was brought to the walled hilltop villages of Languedoc by preachers from northern and eastern Europe. Gnosis represents a spiritual undercurrent which constantly recurs in different regions and eras. Cathar theology was the distant descendant of early Gnostic Christianity. For the Cathars, the only way in which a human being could live a good life uh, was by withdrawing from involvement in worldly power and concentrating on trying to get through this realm of evil with the least possible contamination in the hope that after death they would be able to return to the pure world of uncreated matter, the world of spirit, from which they believed that they'd come. Working from the chronicles and inquisition records at the Centre for Cathar Studies, Anne Brennan and her colleagues have attempted to recreate the consolamentum ceremony in which a Cathar believer, or credon, became a parfait. Anybody who's taken the consolamentum was a parfait. But the word is generally used to mean the people who took the consolamentum at an earlier time in their life and who provided what was in effect the priesthood for the ordinary believers, the credo of the Cathars, who accepted their teachings and who had resolved that they would be consoled. Oui, j'en ai la volonté. Priez Dieu qu'il me donne lui-même sa force. When you'd been consoled and divorced from matter, you had to behave in a way, ways that were consistent with that, which meant that you didn't eat meat, you didn't engage in sex, you didn't engage in any form of violence, you didn't handle money or work for money. The life of a parfait was severe and self-denying. Most Cathar believers were consoled only at the last possible opportunity. Oui. J'en ai la volonté. The consolamentum is something to be taken only at the very last moment, when the danger of its being destroyed by sin is no longer a great one. And so, for most Cathars, consolation came at the moment of death. Like other Gnostics in history, Cathars were condemned as heretics, not least for the equality they allowed women in religious life. The role of women was of primary importance. Inquisition documents tell us exactly how the so-called heresy established itself in Languedoc. The nobility were the first to be affected, and women above all. Cathar matriarchs like Blanche de Lorac dominated the thinking of their families for three or four generations, because the Cathar religion gave women spiritual equality. Women, parfaites, were entitled to preach like men and to confer the sacrament which they had received. Women had an important spiritual role. The Cathars of Languedoc called themselves and asked to be called good men and good women, good Christians or sometimes friends of God. And that shows very well the position they had among the people here. The Cathar church did not levy tithes, and the nobility of Languedoc, who were really very poor, had not much liked paying tithes to the Catholic church, which used to excommunicate people who practiced usury, taking interest on a loan. For the merchant classes in a region of growing trade, that distinction was very significant. They did threaten the power and influence of the Roman Catholic Church. And particularly in this area, the Cathars, in effect, offered a very high spiritual level of spiritual service in return for very low material demands, whereas the Church made rather high material demands in return for a rather low level of spiritual performance. By 1200, the Cathar heresy had attracted many believers among the population of Languedoc. The numbers were growing, and in some areas, Cathars outnumbered loyal Catholics. 
small towns like Fonjou and Lorac were Cathar strongholds, with Parfait dominating religious and social life. We know that by the 1190s, there were a great many Cathars living in Fonjou, and they used the town as a base for their work among the supporters and those who believed in their faith in the country round about. Cathar preachers went out from here and did missionary work and looked after their believers. There were even two Cathar doctors who ran a practice from Fonjo. In 1200, this little town of Fonjo had about 50 different lords. Those were the people who provided the backbone of support for the Cathars and who provided the houses here in which Cathar communities were established. One of them was presided over by Dame Cavers, who was herself one of the greatest of these 50 lords. She entrusted her daughter's upbringing to a parfait. And another of those houses was supervised, presided over by Guy Labert de Castres himself. Guy Labert de Castres? Guy Abert de Castres was one of the most famous Cathar scholars among the local nobility. Fonjou was a town of noblemen where people talked a lot. Guy Abert conducted a ministry in Fonjou for 20 years. Although he was a nobleman by birth and a formidable Cathar jouster in debates with the Catholics, Guy Abert had a fervent following among all the most ordinary Cathar people. After the year 1200, the Roman Church began its pursuit of the Cathar heresy, trying to reconvert the Parfait and Credon by preaching and persuasion. During the next 40 years, violent persecution was to follow. Cathars faced the Inquisition, and later, the first ever crusade within Christendom against self-confessed Christians who expressed a Gnostic disdain for the worldly power of the church. Those who are bent on increasing their power in the world seem sometimes to conceive a special hatred and terror of those who renounce it. And in the case of the Cathars, it's clear that the most important reason why they had to be eliminated was precisely that they were good men. There is really no evidence at all that there was conflict between Cathars and Catholics in this countryside until it was brought here by outsiders. That indeed was one of the things that shocked the outsiders, that they lived together peacefully enough. There is, for example, the story of a knight who was asked why he was not prepared to drive the Cathars out of his land, and he replied, why should we do that? How could we do that? We were brought up with them. Our friends and relations are among them. We see them here living good and peaceful lives among us. To Rome, Cathars were far from being the good men or the pure ones. They were heretics who believed that the world was not God's creation, that salvation was in the individual's hands, that suffering was inherent in the world and nothing to do with human sin that procreation was wrong, and that the church inflicted unnecessary penances and pain on men and women. In 1206, a Spanish monk began his devout mission to win Cathar Credon back to the true Catholic church. Dominic came to debate with Guilobert de Castres in the Cathar stronghold of Fonjo. Dominic engaged in a debate with Guillaume of Castres, because what made him different from the people who had been here before to try to extirpate heresy was that he wanted to play the Cathars at their own game. And part of the game in this part of the world was equal and open debate. That openness and that lack of hierarchy and structure here was something which was um, particularly uh, appalling for men who had spent their lives in England, in France, and in the Roman Church, constructing a hierarchical, authoritarian world, which they found set at defiance by everything that they encountered when they came here in pursuit of the Cathars. And so Dominic set out barefooted, 
dressed in the simplest of clothes, without an entourage, expressing their view of why Catharism should be repudiated and Catholicism adopted once again. Welcome, Dominic, to Fanjou. You have good news for us? Well, that is a matter entirely in your hands. You're having repeatedly rejected the gracious hand of God. Are you the hand of God, Dominic? Or the hand of the Pope? The sword of God is sharp. It has two sides, Gilbert de Castro, but it is one sword. You speak of the sword of God, papal envoy. Now, for men, it is different. He who lives by the sword dies by the sword. So says the master, uh, not in Rome, but in heaven. But you admit the sword of God, Gilbert. Then you admit the judgment of God, and you will be judged. Well, by you, Dominic? By you? <laughs> Dare I say, you and whose army? I have come here not to speak of war, but of mercy. I want to show you the mercy of God. It shines forth for all those who repent of their sins and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. There is mercy for heretics. There is mercy for you. Indeed, Dominic. I've seen an example of your mercy. I saw the mercy you meted out to Pont Roger at Treville. And what was his penance? I shall not remind you. I shall just say that it is a miracle the man can still walk. And should all the fasting and flogging have failed to tear him away from his former redemption, he is to be excommunicated as a heretic and a perjurer. <laughs> is this the mercy of God? Bearing in mind his former state of damnation, I should say this was but a small price to pay for eternal bliss. Is immortal bliss to be bought so easily? The Holy Gospel has made it clear that our salvation has been bought for us by the passion of our Lord upon the cross. Pons Roger must similarly take up his cross and follow the Lord, as must we all. Is it in this that salvation is done? I mean, the cross is the handiwork of Satan. For on it, he tried to destroy the spirit of God. The cross, a shameful instrument of torture. And is this not how the Church of Rome operates? By torturing souls, by preaching a God who causes suffering. I mean, would you have us believe that it is the will of the Father of love, of goodness, of the Holy Spirit, to torture and break his own son? Suffering is the craft of the impostor God, the Rex Mundi, the Lord of this world, whom the Apostle Paul says blind at the hearts of men. The cross is an act of blindness. The crucifiers were blind, Dominic, and you are following them in their blindness. No, Gilbert de Castro. It is you that is blind. The love of God is a mystery even to them that see. By the inexplicable love of God for his creation was the new covenant made upon the cross. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave him to die for us. He died so that sin might die in us. The cross was the victory of God over Satan. For where is the resurrection without the cross? But why should the Father of love achieve redemption through pain? Because the world is in pain. Uh... God created the world, and he saw that it was good. Indeed, when God created the world, it was good. But Adam disobeyed God, and the creation fell from grace with him. And Satan fell and found a place in men's hearts, and sowed divisions among men. Many languages and customs divided men, and men set up stumbling blocks for one another. And the whole creation groaned and travailed that man might again turn to God and be his sons. But false prophets, talking in the words of the gospel, have perverted men. Aye, and none better at it than Rome, friend of the sword, denier of love. You heretics have divided the one church of the apostles. You have set man against man. Well, even in this neighborhood. Thank almighty God that some are turning away from you. Only the other day, Covino, of this town, was converted to the true faith, and God has granted her a Christian husband. For God created her to have children, and thereby experience God's love and grace for his creation. But your doctrines would pervert her nature. You would wish all women to be sterile. For grandparents never to know grandchildren. For fathers never to be able to teach their sons. But it is in the love and grace of God that these things shall be. And they shall. Are you married, Dominic? Does a church allow its priests the grace and love that you speak of? Is it? Am I married? Hmm. No? No. God did not will it so. Didn't he? Does the church keep love and grace from its members? No, indeed not. I shall not be here but for the love and grace which the church communicates to its servants. Nah, you're twisting the truth. A church does not allow its priests to marry because it holds concupiscence to be sinful. And that marriage is only a step further than whoredom. You are hypocrites. If you're as honest as men say you are, you would admit that marriage is indulged because of human frailty. And it's a sign of sinfulness in your doctrines. And you, pure ones, are fed by credant, believers who also are married, and many of whom I know lead lives of sin, breaking the Almighty's commandments by adultery. And you heretics tolerate this sin. Oh, so long as children are not born. Are you so in favor of others? Sharing the miseries of life, Dominic. I mean, would you have us drag down an immortal soul and bind him to our labors and privations? The world is no place for the divine soul. The only hope for the soul in man is that he be awakened and released. And for the Church of Rome, <laughs> I mean, this would be too much of a kindness. I mean, the soul must be burdened with responsibilities, paying priests and bishops to order him around, attending mass. Giving confession to a priest who drinks more wine, has more women, and swears as much or more than himself. I mean, your bindings are endless. Kill a better cast. Here you are again, desperately trying to make men and women surrender the freedom they have worked so hard for. I mean, you're wolves, dressed as sheep, the lot of you. Pride, pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lead not unto thine own understanding. And in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Yes, 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 sir. Yes. I've read the Proverbs of Solomon. And does it not also say there, the righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel, the perfected do not kill animals, nor anyone in war or peace. Does the Lord not lay a visionary feast before blessed St. Peter in the Acts of the Apostles yes, yes. and declare thereby that there is nothing to call profane what God counts clean and was not meat set out there? Yes. And the voice said, Up, Peter, kill and eat. And did Christ not say, Man cannot live by bread alone, 
But when Christ says that he is the bread of life, is he not there indicating his sufficiency for redemption? You talk about the bread of life, yet you condemn the Mass, a very holy sacrament, whereby the Christian receives the blessing of this holy bread. Who is the hypocrite, Gilabedekas? It's quite clear why we regard your Mass with horror, Dominic. I mean, would not Christ also be horrified to find his followers claiming to divide his flesh as his enemies did? I mean, you say the host is part of the body of Christ. But even think that Christ is matter, that is disgusting. Any man or woman here can see that if you put all the hosts together, you would have a body as big as Monsigur. Again, you blaspheme the miracle of the church. Christ said, take, eat. This is my body, which I give to you. I am do this in remembrance of me. Remembrance! <laughs> Dominic, let us look at the facts and uphold the truth. Your mass is an agent of your church. No attendance at mass, no Roman church, no power for the prelates, no money for you to wander the length and breadth of the country. You think if there were no Roman church, the body of Christ would not exist. I mean, don't you know that the body of Christ is spiritual and always was? All things that truly exist are spiritual. For Rex Monday, I could do nothing lasting. The measure of Christ's church is in eternity. But the measure of the Church of Rome is in the succession of its prelates and the girth of their bellies. The church has outlived all the heretics that ever Satan sent against it. Dominic, you count your worth in years. These were said by the Lord of this world to grind men and women down with every passing second. With each year, drawing them on and on to the corruption which is his warped creation. Truly, speak St. John of the word of God, without him was nothing made. This nothing is the foundation of your church. It is of the world. And no matter how much you imitate the perfecti by leading a life of austerity and hardship, you cannot deny this. Oh, Dominic. <laughs> You'd make a far better parfait than lackey to Rome. I tell you, pure one, rather than be in your shoes when the judgment comes, and it will come, I would rather be torn limb from limb than thus my martyrdom be prolonged. I would rather be a mere limbless corpse, with my eyes gouged out, wallowing in my own blood, that I might win the martyr's crown for resisting your heresy. You accuse us of hating the world. I, Dominic, am the servant of the Lord. The same Lord to whom Christ prayed to deliver him from the cross. The same Lord of whom is spoken in the Proverbs. The Lord, by wisdom, hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. How grateful are even the heretics when they see the rain come to nourish the dry land. I have never heard one of them thank Satan for it. Dominic, how the world deceives us. Promising a little, giving nothing, giving a little, denying much. Only of the Father can we expect to be given what we ask for, and that only in spirit. For men as men are sons of Satan, but the soul of man is of God and longs for him. How many have found him with us, and how many have been given stones for bread by the Church of Rome? Before I leave you, Gilabericast, I must tell you something. For a year now, I have spoken words of peace to you. I have preached to you. I have besought you with tears. But as the saying goes in Spain, where a blessing fails, a good thick stick will succeed. Now we shall rouse princes and prelates against you. 
and they, in their turn, will assemble whole peoples and nations. And so many will die by the sword. Towers will fall, walls will be reduced to the ground, and you, all of you, will be reduced to servitude. Thus force will prevail, where gentle persuasion has failed to do so. Despite both gentle and vehement persuasion from papal envoys, Cathar Parfait and Crédon stood by their heresy. Some communities remained loyal to Rome, and others were divided. The Catholic Church implemented the threat of force to bring the heretics back to the one true church. Both the Inquisition and the Albigensian Crusade, named after the town of Albi, now came to the independent-minded longer dog. Such methods merely strengthened the resolve of many Cathars, who regarded themselves as the truest of Christians. But a military contest between heretics who rejected the material world and the armed might of the Roman Catholic Church guaranteed the Cathars' defeat and martyrdom. The history of the war against the Cathars was particularly marked by a number of really massive holocausts. This monument at Minerve, with the dove which represents not only peace, but the Holy Spirit which was particularly beloved by the Cathars, commemorates the first of those holocausts, when in July 1210, 140 parfait were burned here. Minerve was put under siege by the crusading army in June of that year. And with its astonishing natural position, might well have remained impregnable. <laughs> The trebuchet, a new artillery weapon designed by the Archdeacon of Paris, enabled Simon de Montfort's siege army to cut off the Minerve village's access to the only well which offered relief from the summer heat. The rules of engagement for the sieges of the crusade were quite clear. When Cathars surrendered, as was always inevitable, unrepentant Parfait, who had undergone the consolamentum, would go to the stake. But the believers, the rank and file of Catharism, would go free if they accepted Catholic authority. At the end of July, they offered to capitulate on the normal condition that if they did so, they would be allowed honorably to leave in safety. The papal legate Arnold Amory, who was the real commander of the crusading armies, found himself divided by this offer to surrender because as the chronicler said, he passionately desired to see God's enemies die, but as a monk and priest, he didn't dare to strike the blow himself. The army entered Minerve, led by the cross, which was carried here to the church. And then Arnold Amory himself and Simon de Montfort went from house to house, knocking on the doors and inviting the parfait to renounce their faith and return to Catholicism. And they replied, 
why preach at us? We have our own faith and care nothing for the Church of Rome. So 140 of them were brought to the great pile of wood which had been constructed here. And the chronicler says, our men didn't have the trouble of pushing them into it, for their obstinacy and their heresy was such that they flung themselves joyfully into the flames. Three months after Minel, the castle of Town fell to a Christian army led by Simon de Montfort and the bishops of Chartres and Beauvais. The crusade represented the good thick stick that Dominic had promised, and more. It went hand in hand with the persuasive methods of the Inquisition to get Cathar believers to confess and recount their heresy. Both prongs of this attack were far cruder than the earlier efforts to debate real theological differences with the Cathars. Now they were to be treated as criminals. All these inquisitors who were let loose on the country had a very precise mission, to root out heresy. But it was heresy in caricature. They made no effort to understand the theological subtleties of this religion which they had to combat. The inquisitors were not at all interested in doctrines. They needed to draw up lists of names. They were policemen. Some Cathar Christians returned to the Catholic Church but devoted Cathars retreated to resist to the very end. Almost the whole population of Fongeau followed Guilobert de Castres some 50 miles to Montségur, a spectacular fortified peak in the foothills of the Pyrenees. Ce n'est que 25 ans plus tard, en 1232, in 1232, at the request of the Cathar Bishop of Toulouse, Guillaume de Castres, Raymond de Perey made Montségur the seat and capital of the Cathar Church. Pierre Roger de Mirepoix formed a garrison of about a hundred knights and sergeants who were to defend Montségur to the bitter end. In the same year, the Papal Inquisition was also at work in the region around Montségur, in villages like Vals. In 1242, the Inquisitors who had been appointed by the Pope to root out the Cathar heresy from this area had been at work for eight years. Several hundred people had been identified as supporters and credo of the Cathars and had been given penances being made to wear yellow crosses on their clothing or to go on pilgrimage. Some had been burned and the lands of others had been confiscated. And one thing which particularly enraged the population was that many people who had been identified as Cathars and had died were exhumed, their bodies dragged through the streets and burned. The reaction of the Cathars at Montségur was decisive and ultimately sealed their fate. A raiding party of knights and sergeants descended from the castle and assassinated a party of four inquisitors near Toulouse. One of the assassins, who became one of the last defenders of Montségur, was the Lord of Vals, Guillaume Adamar. His family history sums up a century of religious change. His sister was a parfait, and his father had taken the consolamentum on his deathbed 15 years or so before. And yet, not much more than 100 years before that, at the beginning of the 12th century, Guillaume Adamar's forebears had commissioned an extraordinary series of frescoes for their church here at Vals. The theme of these frescoes, which were painted a little after 1100 by Catalan artists, is the incarnation and life of Christ. We have the Annunciation to the Virgin directly above my head, and over there the Baptism of Christ. Perhaps most remarkably in this context, Christ giving the keys to St. Peter, which is of course the episode on which the claims of the Roman Church to supremacy over the whole of Christendom were founded. Now those themes would have been quite repugnant to the Cathar descendants of the Lord who commissioned these frescoes, who found the idea of Christ in a human body disgusting and abominated and loathed the Roman church. So in the course of the 12th century, 
the members of this family went through a religious transformation from the conventional, possibly rather fervent Catholic piety which commissioned the frescoes to the committed last-ditch Catharism of Guillaume Adhemar. It was the assassination of the Inquisitors which made Monségur the last ditch for Catharism and a lasting monument to the defeat of this medieval Gnostic Christianity. C'est le, le choc en retour, l'Église et le Roi de France before long, the Catholic Church and the French King responded and decided to overthrow Montségur. In the spring of 1243, a huge siege army was set in place. Inside, there were 205 or so parfaits, both men and women, the garrison of about 100 soldiers, and 131 other women and children who have been identified. So there were 450 to 500 people who were to hold out for 10 months against the royal siege army. Shortly before Christmas, the royal forces gained a foothold on the mountain and began to approach the chateau itself. About the 21st of February, 1244, the first assault on the castle, using ladders, was repelled. But the fighting was murderous, as the assailants had installed catapults. You can still find limestone balls of 80 kilos in the forest below. The defenders were soon in a hopeless position. And on the 2nd of March, Pierre Roger de Mirepoix asked to parley with the Seneschal of the King and obtained a 15-day truce. On the 13th of March, an extraordinary event took place, which, for me, represents the true secret of Montségur. Twenty men and women, whose names we have, went to the Cathar bishop. Bertrand Marty, Guillaume de Castro, was dead. They were only credents, believers, not parfaits. But they asked to receive the Cathar sacrament, the consolamentum, knowing very well that becoming parfait would mean they would go to the stake when the siege ended. And so three days later, these 20 people joined all the other parfaits and went with them to the stake. That is why 225 people were burned at the foot of this mountain on the 16th of March, 1244. Catharism did not end abruptly at Montségur, but went to ground, its spiritual content overwhelmed by the worldly power of Rome. It was a battle which could only confirm the Cathars' opinion that the world was a place of wickedness and pain, and that salvation was found not in a church which called up armies to eliminate the true believers, but in a devotion to honouring the individual soul in God and pursuing the knowledge of the heart. When the Cathars appeared here in the 1160s, their personal austerity, absolute self-denial, poverty and humility offered a model of sanctity and religious leadership, which was a very powerful and attractive alternative to the one that was offered by the Catholic Church. This was certainly one of the great tragedies of religious intolerance. And I think that if the world today regards the history of Catharism with such curiosity and emotion, it is because people see in Montségur a symbol of eternal intolerance. There is also in Catharism matter for very deep spiritual and religious reflection. Of that, I am absolutely convinced. The physical defeat of Cathar Gnosticism was complete, yet the pulse of Gnosis continued to beat. 300 years later, in the midst of the artistic and scientific explosion of the Renaissance in Italy, Gnosis emerged again in a new guise. It originated partly with the discovery of Gnostic writings from Egypt, preceding by 500 years the discovery at Nag Hammadi. Its new form was known as Hermetic philosophy after Hermes, messenger of the gods. One of Hermes' modern champions, the Dutch businessman Joost Rittman, first touched the pulse of Gnosis 
at Montségur. I think that the very first time that I came to the south of France, the architecture of this castle struck me so very much that I knew inwardly that it was not only a building to protect people, but that also as a human being has a value. I believe that this castle was built to carry a value. In the next programme in this series, the thread of Gnosis in Hermetic philosophy runs from Renaissance princes and scholars to magic and the modern world of plastics and international airlines. The heretics died, but the heritage of the Cathars survived. Thank you.